Who here is working with Koji? What, in what capacity? Saki. You make Saki. Awesome. Okay. I got into it because I met this guy, Jeremy Umansky, who is a chef in Cleveland, Ohio, and he uh, started cultivating koji in order to um, elevate foods on the restaurant menu where he was working and found out that he could grow it on pretty much anything and was seeing crazy effects like tenderizing and faster curing of meats and stuff. Um, and so he sort of encouraged me to give it a try with charcuterie, which is cured meats which I did, it was super scary at first, um, but uh, I was immediately addicted because Koji is super duper amazing. Um, and so now I'm sort of diving further into all the different applications of Koji. So my three point is using it to cure meats, but I also use it for carrot pickles and making miso and other things that it's more traditionally used for. So what is Koji? That would be a good place to start. It's a filamentous fungi or fungi. This is a picture of it under the microscope flowering phase. It's really beautiful. Thought I would share that with you. It's almost like any surface mold you've ever seen. That's a picture of it growing on rice. So it creates like a white fluffy mold on the surface of grains and it's what we call a saccharifying mold. So it likes to metabolize starches. It's used basically for tenderization, um, fermentation, and creating complexity of flavor in foods around the world. But it's mostly used in Asia um, its first, I guess, solid state fermentation was in China. And it was grown on, it was kind of just started growing on these cakes that they would make of all these indigenous plants. I think it was 20 plus species in these, in these cakes that would start to get these white molds on top of them. And then they started isolating those molds and using them for other fermentation product, um, projects. Foods that you're most familiar with that it's used in are sake, soy sauce, and miso. So those foods would not be possible without koji. The scientific name is Aspergillus oryzae. If anybody's interested in that part of it, there are other types of Aspergillus molds that are used in culinary applications. Uh, however, its closest relatives are actually toxic, um, which is one of the craziest things about Aspergillus oryzae, Aspergillus niger, and a lot of the other ones that are not toxic to us. And it's really believed that the reason they are no longer toxic to us is because they've co-evolved with humans in culinary. The idea is that because people started using aspergillus molds in co coordination with yeasts to ferment foods, that they evolved to not produce aflatoxins like their close cousins do. And I've done a little bit of research on whether or not, because I had a, I had a koji practitioner one time tell me that people who are cultivating koji like I am have a chance of cross-contamination with wild strains of aspergillus that could actually be toxic. And I've done a little research about that, and I think it's really unlikely. Um, so if that's something that's coming up for anybody, I just downloaded a peer-reviewed article about that very thing that I haven't had a chance to read, but I'd be happy to send it on to anybody who's interested in that type of deal. The cool thing about koji is that it is, it's sort of like a powerhouse fermenter. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because it releases all these crazy enzymes. And so it's gonna form this mat on top of traditionally rice or barley, but you can grow it on anything that's starchy, millet, it's grown on adukey beans. It's grown on lots of different starchy items. So it's gonna produce this mycelial mat. It's gonna inject its little hypha, which is the sort of the root system of a fungus, into the food, and then release these enzymes, namely amylase enzymes, which are starch metabolizing enzymes, and then protease, which are protein metabolizing enzymes. This is why it's really effective at tenderizing meats. This is why it's really effective at breaking down complex relatively flavorless molecules into smaller, more flavorful molecules like peptides, amino acids, and stuff like that. So that's kind of the science of why koji creates such a depth of flavor. It really sort of brings out the sour, sweet, and the bitter components of foods that are already in them. And so it takes the ordinary and makes it more complex. If everybody's familiar with the taste, the sour, sweet, bitter, salty, and then umami, so umami is, is the Japanese word for delicious. And it's basically that fullness that you feel in your mouth when you eat cheeses or when you eat meats. Um, and koji is, is really characteristic of that fullness in the mouth, that umami flavor. And one of the things I meant to do, I brought the pickled carrots, but I also meant to just like give you some raw carrots and then sprinkle a little bit of shio koji on some carrots and let it sit for like 15 minutes and have you try it again. Because what you would taste is like, a more pronounced carrot flavor and you'd feel that blooming on your tongue of the umami. We did it 
today at my house, my partner and I, because I was just like, well, let's just see what happens. I do have some tastes of honey for you guys with different iterations of koji so that you can kind of see how the different secondary ferments express themselves. But we'll get to that in just a second. One of the things that I read yesterday that really fascinated me was that soy sauce, which is probably the most widely traded food in the world that uses koji, it was invented in China 2,500 years ago. And then the recipe was brought to Japan by Buddhist monks in the 13th century. That's some old food, you guys. Like, that's crazy. And so koji is really associated with Japanese cuisine today, but it actually originated in China and still used in China. The character for koji in Japan is still a Chinese character, and it means grains fermented by fungi. Koji fermentation is, is the process of malting. Um, barley for distillation of liquor or beer. That happens by germinating the seed and then allowing it to ferment. And so koji is sort of the Eastern equivalent of that. And koji is actually a much more enzymatically powerful process for breaking down starches. And so when koji was first patented or a process like koji was first patented is when a Japanese dude came over to the States and looked at the distillation process and said, hey, I can use this koji stuff to make this way better. And so he was working with a distilling company to do that. And then he actually patented the microbial strain as a digestive aid. And so it was marketed widely um, by the pharmaceutical company as a health supplement. And it still is to this day. Um, and there's research, which I can also point you to if you're interested in this kind of stuff, that shows that koji is um, anti-anxiety. It can be used in fatigue disorders, liver disorders, um, it can be, it has anti-allergy capabilities. Um, it, can be, it can be used to address like hypertension. So people on low salt diets and low sugar diets um, can really use this stuff in their cooking and, and receive benefit from it. Um, and it's anti-carcinogenic and it's also an immune booster. Um, so it's very probiotic. Um, and so we're gonna talk about a couple different ways that you can use koji in your cooking tonight. We're gonna to go all the way from growing it yourself. It's very much worth it if you're into that kind of stuff, but we're also gonna talk about a way for you to go and procure some in an Asian market and get going right away on using it and you're getting the health benefit as well as getting that nice umami flavor enhancement in the food. Any questions so far? Fish look sauce, look, look Yes. Is that the same type of ferment? It's not usually fermented using koji, it's just a fermented, fit, um, product. Um, but it could be. Basically anything that you ferment, you can ferment with koji. So when you say you can ferment with koji, do you mean fermenting with koji alone or fermenting with koji and yeast? Um, you can do both. So most, most koji preparations like miso, sake, soy sauce are two-phase fermentation processes, so we're going to talk about that. So there's a solid state fermentation phase, which I'm going to teach you how to do tonight. We're going to do it together. Um, and you can, and we're going to do it on rice. That's what you see here. This is what we call the solid state fermentation phase. The fungus is in its active growth phase. You want to pull it off before it starts to reproduce, basically. And then you can take that solid state fermented rice product and you can freeze it or you can dehydrate it. And then you would either pulverize it or take parts of it and then use it in what we call secondary ferments. One of the great things about koji is that even after the solid state fermentation process is over, and I take it out of the conditions that it likes for doing this growing and flowering, it will still continue to release its enzymes if I put it in the refrigerator, if I put it in my pocket, if I, you know, whatever. There is, you can kill it, obviously, but it is very active. And my friend Jeremy has even taken it out, put it in the freezer, and then taken it out of the freezer, thawed it, and put it back into an incubator, and it will continue to flower, right? So it's very aggressive. One of the other good things about that is that it will outcompete other surface molds that might come in during solid state fermentation. This is why it's really great in charcuterie. If you buy a salami with a white mold on the outside of it, that's a mold called penicillium that is added in the, in the charcuterie process to protect that product from other molds, but also to impart flavor. Koji does that faster, better, you know, than a penicillium mold, in my opinion, just from my experience. I still use both of them. But, you know, it's, it's kind of the same idea. Um, most surface molds will not hurt you. Some of them produce aflatoxins, but most of the time they're just molds that thrive in high humidity and, and in oxygen-rich environments that are going to produce off flavors in your food. So whenever you're working with a beneficial aggressive mold that has a nice flavor like koji, 
you know, then that, that's going to give you the benefit of out-competing all those other like dark green, black, or fuzzy blue molds that you don't really want on the surface of foods. Here's another example. This is koji growing on the surface of a pork loin. This is the first thing that I ever grew koji on. Well, I grew it on rice before this, actually. I took a five pound pork loin, it's a pretty expensive piece of meat, and stuck it in an 80 degree incubator for 48 hours. I thought for sure it was gonna rot. You know, I inoculated it with koji spores, which look like this. This little booger green powder right here. Um, put it on that pork loin, stuck it in an 80 degree incubator for 48 hours. Thought it was gonna rot, came back, opened the lid, and it smelled like a wildflower meadow. <laughs> that pork loin was cured, the recipe for it is in the Pure Charcuterie book. It's cured with Chinese five spice and salt and then the koji was grown on it and then it was hung up and fermented and dried for about three, four months. And I took it to a food show and fed it to a bunch of chefs. They were freaking out. They were like, it tastes like sweet potato pie? What is this? We don't know what's happening. Um, where can I get this? And I'm like, well, it's completely illegal. <laughs> I can't sell it to you, but <laughs> that's the, an example of the mycelium and the yellow parts that you see there are the koji starting to go into its reproductive phase. So eventually it's gonna turn from white to yellow to dark green, and the dark green is the spore that's then captured and sold. I often buy in my spores again, because I found that if I try to take my koji to the reproductive phase and save it, then my coverage gets weaker and weaker over time. Koji spores are very cheap to purchase. Um, the only company in the United States, I believe still, that's selling them is Gem Cultures, it's G-E-M, out in California. And it's super old school. You get on their website and you have to actually like either fill out a handwritten form or you have to send them an email and say, I want you to send me this. Here's my address. Will you PayPal me an invoice? And then they'll do it and they'll send you a little envelope. But the cool thing about them too is they send you instructions for culturing any product that they're going to sell you. So if you're a fermenter and you don't know about gem cultures, they've got all kinds of crazy stuff, koji included. And you can buy spores for barley, uh, red beans, and rice, I believe on their website. Another great thing that you can do is produce what we call secondary ferments with koji. And so that would be if I were to take that rice and then you're gonna follow recipes on your handout, mix it with more cooked rice, and then let it ferment at different temperatures or with or without salt. And you can reduce these secondary ferments. One of them is called shio koji. That's the salty secondary ferment. And then the other one's called amazaki or amakoji. And there are two different iterations of that. There are a sweet one and a sour one. Um, there can be many different iterations, but those are the two main ones. And so I think of sort of like three different classes of secondary ferments. Um, I have spoons for you guys. And I don't know how you wanna do this. I'd like for you to somehow get a taste of all of these bowls of honey. So, because I want you to, to get a sense of the character of each of the, di the different secondary ferments. This is a bowl of raw honey. This is a bowl of raw honey with sweet amazaki mixed in with it. This is a bowl of raw honey with sour amazaki mixed in with it. And this is a bowl of honey with, with shio koji mixed in with it. And you're gonna be able to see how powerful koji is in its different iterations that completely changing the character of one single item. Just taste them and you'll, you'll just, you can see where you can go with this, you know. Think of something that you would normally put honey on and then think about how you would use it with these different tastes, yeah. The amazaki is, is a variety of? So amazaki is like a cooked rice porridge with the koji added into it and then it's fermented at a specific temperature. The higher the temperature, the sweeter of an amazaki you'll get and the lower the temperature, the more savory or sour of an amazaki you'll get. So it's basically like, um, so here's different states of koji growing on rice. This is a white rice koji that's been in the incubator for 24 hours. So it's not quite fuzzy and white yet. This is a brown rice that's been in for probably 30 hours. And this would be, this is old. And I do not encourage you to smell it because it's, it's old. It smells alcoholic. It shouldn't smell that way. But you can see the white mycelia just barely on this old Koji. So I would take, for example, if you look at the recipe for sour amazaki, it's on the bottom of the first page of your handout, you're going to take a much greater quantity of water to rice than you normally would. So 10 cups of water, one cup of rice. You're going to cook that rice in that water till you create like a really soupy, porridgey, 
rice mix. Then you're going to mix in one cup of koji rice, sometimes called koji kin. That means it's been, yes. And then and it, a cup, so more than this. And then depending on the type of amazaki you wanted, if you wanted a sour amazaki in this case, you want to cool that rice porridge to about 80 degrees, mix the koji in, and then keep that sucker at 80 degrees for six to 10 hours. And then you're done. You've made the amazaki. These I've buzzed in a food processor so that they're like, you can't anymore see the rice in them, but you can leave the rice floating in it, and that's fine too. Yeah. This temperature stable duration, I heard you mention incubator. Yeah. Is that something that you need to be able to do this well? You can do, um, yes, if you want to grow your own koji, if you want to do this solid state part, you kind of need to build an incubator or you need a food dehydrator that's adjustable down to about 80, 80 to 90 degrees. So Excalibur does make a food dehydrator that goes down that low. And then you want humidity. So you'll have to add like a water pan or something in there. Koji to grow like this likes temperatures between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of about 85%. So it's pretty high humidity and it's pretty high temperatures. But you don't want it to get too hot or it'll die, right? And too, and too cool and it won't flower. So I've achieved this. I can show you one of my incubators and then we're gonna put one together here. So this is a box made out of foam insulation board that my partner built me, which is, a, he just glued the panels together with, I wanted something I could hang a whole ham in. So I said, you know, build me one the size of a dorm fridge. And so he just grabbed a bunch of foam board, slapped it together, and drilled ventilation holes. You want airflow. It's an aerobic mold, right? So it likes air. So he's drilled air holes. And honestly, I could use a few more in here that I need to get in there and drill them. And then we've got bamboo. See the bamboo rods coming out the side? So here's the inside of it. I have an incandescent light bulb, basically a heat lamp in there. And it's plugged into like an external thermostat, basically. And so I have that thermostat set at 80 to 82 degrees. And then I plug the light into it, basically, and plug the whole thing into the wall. So that thing tells the light to turn off if it starts to get above 80, 82 degrees, and the light kicks on if it starts to get below 80 degrees. Then I have a little loaf pan of water in there. The one thing that this incubator does not give me that I wish it did is forced air. I would like air going through it because I think I would get a fuzzier coverage, a better coverage, but I get decent, decent coverage. What's that? Like a greenhouse fan? Something or a little computer fan even would be pl probably plenty. So either more ventilation holes or I think I don't really have high enough humidity and I don't have good enough airflow. The next picture is just a picture of some of my dehydrator trays full of rice and then covered in either parchment or cheesecloth while they're in there. Because you are going to get condensation. You don't want the water dripping onto the rice. You want to keep it kind of dry. Um, so you got to have some kind of coverage. It also keeps humidity in there if it's wrapped in some way. Some people use plastic wrap, but I'm not a fan of it. So I just use cheesecloth or parchment. It works fine. I've also provided a link. Ariel Johnson, she works for the MAD. Well, she works for MIT now, I guess, but she used to work for MAD, which is a cool organization, Denmark, affiliated with Noma Restaurant. She's like a microbiologist, I guess, but she's, she's got um, open source plans for her incubator up on GitHub, and I provided the link for you so you can go check out hers. I'm pretty sure it's like a fridge drawer lined with like insulating, an insulating blanket, and then she's got like an ink bird or some other temperature controller plugged into it, and it's pretty much the same deal. But a lot of people use refrigerators. What we're going to use tonight is, was what I started with, and I actually really like this one. Just a Rubbermaid with an aquarium uh, heater. This I picked up at PetSmart for like 25, 30 bucks. It goes from 68 degrees all the way to 88 degrees. So it's not gonna get too, too hot. I just set it at about 80, plug it in, fill this bad boy up with water, submerge the thermometer in it. And you wanna get it going a little bit before you put the rice in there. I usually get like, a loaf pan or a cake pan or something and put it in the bottom. And then my rice will actually go in here and it will sit above the surface of the water. But with the lid on this, it's going to keep a great consistent temperature inside and the water is going to provide a ridiculous amount of humidity. So you'll get pretty good coverage. The only thing I don't like about this system is that your product is sitting flat on here and there's no flow through it. 
So it'll get a little soggy on the bottom and you won't necessarily get fluffy coverage on the bottom. That's okay. One of the great things about Koji is that even when you don't have the coverage, if you have it somewhere, you're getting enzymes. And the enzymes are what are doing, doing the work for you even after you get through solid state fermentation. Is everybody with me? Okay. So this is fine and this is great, affordable, really easy way to start if you want to start culturing Koji. Is part of your tutorial? Yeah. Online tutorial? Um, I don't have an online tutorial, but I provided you with Ariel Johnson's um, link to just, it's like pictures and an, it's kind of like an instructable, if you've ever used that website, on how she built her incubator. So how do you want to do this? Do you want to just come up one by one? Just go through each, each taste. Tastes like honey, right? Okay, Give it a little sweet. stir. Mm -hmm. So this is the sweet Amazaki. So this is produced by making a rice porridge, 10 cups of water to one cup of rice, adding a cup of the koji rice in, and then incubating it at 138 degrees Fahrenheit. I put it in my oven. My oven has a really low heat setting. You could also put it in a food dehydrator to, to achieve that. That's really good. That would be good on anything. So these different secondary ferments are used for a bunch of different things. So I could take a carrot inoculate it with these spores, put it in my incubator, grow the fuzzy mold on it, and cook it if I wanted to. That's one thing I could do. I could take a pork chop, put this on there, put it in my incubator, and then cook it in butter. And it's going to give me like a burst of umami. It's going to give me tenderization. It's going to give me a dry aged taste. The other thing I could do is take a carrot and dump a bunch of shio koji over top of it and get a pickling effect right, without growing the mold directly on the carrot. So there's a bunch of different things that we can do. It's in your handout kind of what these things are used for. To make miso, for example, you're gonna, they would culture the koji. You know, if you buy barley miso, for example, you're, you're eating a soybean paste that was fermented with barley that had koji on it. Does that make sense? Rice miso, you're eating a soybean paste that was fermented with rice koji. So you're going to take, grow the koji on barley or rice, and then set it aside, and then you're going to cook the soybeans for the miso, mash them up, and then you're going to take a cup or whatever of that koji grain, put it into the cooled soybeans with a certain amount of salt. There are sweet misos and salty misos, so it's a different amount of salt per. If anybody wants me to get into that, I will, but this is not a miso making class, so I don't want to overwhelm you with all the different preps. And that's another reason why I provided you with resources. So you can go, depending on what your particular interest is, what you want to use Koji for, you can then go check out Nancy Singleton Hachisu's amazing book if you want to learn about making salad dressing or pickles. If you want to learn about making miso, check out Sandra Katz's book. If you want to learn about charcuterie, get my book and you can get more detailed. So what you're gonna experience is the first bowl is like honey and the last bowl is almost like a sauce that you would have used several ingredients to make out of honey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's quite savory indeed. It's impressive that it's so few ingredients. Right? Really. And one of the things that's so impressive to me, particularly about sweet Amazaki, is there is no sugar in that product. That's all grain. And what's happening there is the enzymes are breaking down pretty much all the protein and all the starch in that rice at such a high temperature, they're moving and they're working very quickly, so that what you're left with is esters and compounds that are in that grain inherently. There's honey in all the pots, but I've just used the different koji ferments to enhance the honey. So I think what you'll notice is that you still taste the honey, but you taste it in different ways. So the sweet amazake is gonna make the honey even sweeter, right? That the sour amazake is gonna make it a little savory, tangy, and then the salty shio is going to actually turn it into a salty, almost like sauce. And that really gives you a sense of like, if you were to just, how, how you would use, I guess, some of these secondary ferments. So sweet amazake, for example, if you added yeast to that, somebody asked if you use yeast in combination with koji in order to produce fermentation reactions. When you're making sake, the answer is yes. Koji alone can't produce alcoholic fermentation, but if you combine it with the yeast in Amazaki, then you're on your way to making sake. It's more complicated than that, as these fellows would be happy to tell you, but um, <clears throat> basically, 
That's what I mean when I say a two-phase fermentation process. Phase one would be actually culturing the koji on the grain. Phase two would be producing the amazaki, adding the yeast. Soy sauce, similarly, growing the koji on soybean and wheat, okay, and then making a soybean and wheat paste and adding in the cultured soybean and wheat into a mix called, what they call a maromi, and then letting that ferment for a year or more. Your sheet says polished rice soda. Mm -hmm. You don't really need polished rice or barley. That's what Jeremy wrote, but... Honestly, like polished rice or barley is just like refined flour where like a lot of the inherent like goodness of the grain is being removed in a refining process. So <clears throat> you can buy unpolished rice or barley and it's going to have plenty of starch for koji to do its work and it's also going to have more nutritive quality. And you don't want to rinse it because you want the starch there, right? That's what koji wants to eat. So, so what is the method for making the shio koji? So the method for making the shio koji is cooking rice. The recipe here I have is eight ounces of koji rice. So that's this. Solid state fermentation is complete. You've got the nice white haifa or, you know, mycelial mat growing on your rice. Take eight ounces of that. You combine it. I do this in a half gallon mason jar on my kitchen counter. I take a, a cup of that, combine it with a cup and a quarter of water. Make sure the water's non-chlorinated, by the way. Chlorine kills microorganisms, so... You can't really ferment with it. Um, and then you mix in two ounces of sea salt. And then you're gonna sit that at room temperature on your counter seven to 10 days, stirring it every day, once or twice a day. And it's fermenting as it's sitting there. Um, so the reason shio is salty is because you've added salt to it, right? It's a salt substitute. Um, if you added, it would probably take you a teaspoon of shio koji to dress up some sauteed vegetables, like literally make them 100% better than they would if you just sauteed them in butter. And if you added that shio, a teaspoon of it at the end of sauteing, you could omit salt from the recipe completely and you'd probably end up using less salt than you would if you were sprinkling salt on your food. So this has huge implications for people who are on low salt diets, right? You can probably also produce a shio koji that is palatable to you with less salt than is in my recipe, right? So if you are on a low salt diet or you know someone is on a low salt diet, you know, experiment. See how, how low you can get that salt. I have a friend, Rick, down in Florida who owns a company called Native Sun Koji, and he produces um, products for chefs that he, that he uses koji, mixes it with flour, mixes it with salt. He produces shio and amazaki and sells them to chefs, which is really great because chefs can't have a, an incubator running at 80 degrees in their kitchen, you know, with a pork loin inside of it. That's going to get them, their inspector real mad. Um, and so selling secondary ferments or pulverized koji kin, the solid state ferment, and mixing it with salt and flour gives the chefs a product to use that elevates flavor and puts that umami punch into the food. So Rick is producing those products and he's done a lot of research on it and shared with me that koji actually has an electromagnetic charge. So it can, it can reduce water activity. So this is like advanced um, preservation, but... Basically, the marker of shelf stability in any food, I don't care if you're talking about pork or apricots, is a reduced level of water available for biological reactions. So that's not the total water in the food, it's the water available for bacteria to either use for good things or bad things. Um, and so the way we've done that for years and years and years is with salt. Salt has an electromagnetic charge that draws the salts or the water in the cells of the food out. So that reduces that water activity, creates shelf stability over time. But with koji, you can achieve that with decreased salt content, right? Huge implications. That was like my Christmas gift, you know? Um, still haven't done it yet. Still haven't gotten, gotten it right, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, it just doesn't taste as good as I would like it to, you know? But I'm, I'm working up, you know? I'm starting at low salt and going up, and I'm using combinations of Rick's umami salt, which is basically just salt with koji, pulverized koji mixed into it. Um, umami flour, which is flour with koji mixed into it, and then actually putting the pork belly into the incubator, culturing koji on it, and then cold smoking it, right? So different combinations of those. I would love to achieve like 1%, 1.5% salt, which is unheard of. I mean, if you, if you cure meats, 2.5% two to 3.5% two to salt on cured items is and on bacon, it can be up to 4% to the weight of the meat, which is a huge amount of salt. <laughs> Any of these products can be used to pickle. 
So those carrots you tasted at the beginning of the class, I put them in shio. That's why they tasted really salty. Did you guys get some? I put them in shio at probably 10 o'clock this morning. Um, and so one of the things we talked about in the beginning of class is that one of the only ways to produce a quick pickle, like in Western culinary think, is to use a hot vinegar brine. Well, that's not a probiotic pickle. You heat that vinegar up to a really to a, above boiling point, and you pour it over the food. You're not only killing a bunch of nutrients in the food, but you're also killing any microorganisms that are there. So a lot of people who do home fermentation say, "Oh, well, we'll just we'll do a salt, a whole um, a salt fermented pickle or a salt brined pickle." Well, that takes time. So Japanese methodology is like the utmost in quick pickling. Brand, rice brand pickling is one of the ways that Japanese folks achieve pickles quickly. But this is even easier in my opinion. It's really, if anybody ever has kept up with nuka pot or a rice bran pot, it's really labor intensive. Um, but this stuff, I can produce shio on my kitchen counter in seven days in a half gallon mason jar. And then whatever I know I'm not gonna use, I can freeze it. Or I can keep it in my fridge for up to a year. I'll take um, raw vegetables throw them out on a platter, drizzle the shio koji over top of them, walk away for 10 minutes, come back, and it tastes like you've done something amazing to the vegetables when really you did was drizzle it with shio. How long did you let the carrots sit? I submerged them in this mason jar um, at 10 o'clock this morning, and I pulled them out at about 6 when we started. In my opinion, they sat in there a little bit too long. I like a salty pickle, but some people don't. It depends on the vegetables, too. Carrots are really, you know, harder to pickle than, say, um, you know, if you put a mushroom in shio, it's not going to take any, long, any time at all to get that tenderization, to get that saltiness. I would say maybe 10, 10 minutes. Um, peas, snow peas, drizzle that shio on there and eat them right away. You'll get the effect. Cucumber slices would be the same way. Yeah, so you don't want them to get mushy, right? You still want them to be crispy and you don't want it to be over salty. If you're not a fan of the shio pickle, you can always pickle with a sour amazaki. So this is used in savory applications and the only difference really between this and the shio is that there's no salt in this product. It produces a savory taste in your mouth without the salt, All right? So this is used for pickling. Both shio and sour amazaki, as well as sweet amazaki, are used for marinating meats and fishes, vegetables. Um, I took some pork chops last week. At 1 p.m., I put them in like maybe three tablespoons of sweet amazaki, vacuum sealed them, and put them in the fridge. And took them out when I was ready to cook them, rinsed them, dried them off, let them sit, and then threw them in, a, in some butter. And what I got was not only a better tasting pork chop, just, just the flavor of it bloomed, but I got amazing browning reactions when I cooked it because of the effects of the koji, right? So it's, it's a powerful tool. Um, if all this sounds really scary to you, you can go to the Asian store and you can buy shio, and you can buy a similar, they were out of it when I went to pick this up yesterday, you can buy amazaki as well. It looks like this. It won't have English on it, except maybe on the back. Shio Koji, so you gotta look for it, or you can ask. But it'll be in the refrigerator. This stuff has to be refrigerated or frozen. Um, and I mean, this, like I said, depending on what you wanna do, you know, you, you could keep this for a while and just be using a couple teaspoons at a time, or you could be, if you're pickling with it, you're gonna be submerging stuff. I will reuse this. The stuff that my carrots were floating in, nothing wrong with that at all. It may get less salty because, which may be a good thing, the vegetables are gonna draw salt out of it. So I could start using it more like a sour amazaki, maybe over time. But I would use this until it started to not taste very good. Yeah. Did you find that at Foreign Affairs? Foreign Affairs is where I got this. Um, if you live around here on the corner of um, Hendersonville Road and, and Butler Bridge, there's an Asian market um, that will have it. And then my favorite is Lee's on Hendersonville Road. Yeah. Yeah. Like how long would you keep it in the fridge? The shio? Or th this? This is just shio. Uh, you mean like the carrots? No, like that liquid, how long would it be good? I would give it a year, probably. Just as long as I would give a shio or, a, or an amazaki. I'm looking at this and I see that it says there's alcohol in it. And I don't know if that means that alcohol has been added, um, which is not awesome. That would be one of the reasons to make your own, you know what I mean? Um, some stores you can buy koji kin, so you can buy like 
grains with the koji like pulverized in them, but, but it's m more like you're gonna have to order that online. So you can order like this, the spores, or you can order like finished koji for going ahead and making miso, right? So, so this is gonna be the spores for if I wanna grow it on the rice to make the miso. But I can also buy a powder that looks very much like this that is the rice that's already had the koji grown on it, that's been bucked up in a food processor that I can then add to my mashed up soybeans and I'm on my way to making miso. So there's a lot of different, koji kin. So there's a lot of different entry points for you. You don't have to be a total nerd to benefit from this. That's um, the koji kin, that's the spores of the koji. Yes. And that's the starting point for making your own. Yes. They do use a different process, I believe, for isolating the spores. Like these are imported from Japan, and the companies are using a different process for isolating the spores that I would use to cultivate my own koji culture um, than they are when they sell me koji kin. But a lot of companies will, it will be one and the same, right? So you can use the same product to grow your own koji or to just start making miso. And you'll run into a lot of Japanese words when you're doing this that you might have to research further. So there's there are preparations for pickling that look like this that are actually like amazaki with salt added. Totally different from what we're talking about now. So read about it. I mean, it's cool, all the different products that are used and have been used for centuries to do this. Back to your jar that you had to pick the yes. carrots in. So you said it got less salty with time. Could you just add some salt back in it? Yeah. And what you would you do when you were done with it? Are you you throw it away, or is there another incarnation? When I use shio to pickle, I just kind of use it indefinitely. I'm never going to have, like, this same quantity of shio using over and over again. Like, I'm going to be mixing it with new shio, or I'm going to be mixing it with something else, and eventually it's going to get eaten, or it's going to get used. I take sweet amazaki, and I put it in my smoothies. I make a breakfast shake with, like, cacao and sweet amazaki and a frozen banana and, you know, yogurt. And so this gets consumed rather quickly in my household. You can also eat it straight. It's like the best um, rice pudding, the sweetest, best rice pudding you've ever had. Question here. So in the jar there, is it like a, a sourdough starter in that like, you know, you're kind of, all, do you have to feed it? And like, are you, you can just add to it. You just add to it. Like, I, this is my shio koji. I'll just dump it back in there. It's basically the same. Yeah. So you're Zero. essentially like, you keep using it and it's like it changes slightly. Depending on what you're doing with it, you may not use it again. So if I'm going to sprinkle it on a vegetable, I'm just going to eat it. You know, if I'm using it to pickle, I'd reuse it. Some people wouldn't, you know, but I would. And, and it's just like if you do rice bran pickles, you know that, like, the vegetables are drawing salt out of the mix over time. So the same thing would probably happen to this. And whether you choose to resalt it or not, it's up to you. You could just, like, use it as a less salty, more, like, savory sour amazaki you know, incubate some proteins in it, in which case I would not reuse it, right? Don't brine raw meats with your shio and then reuse your shio. I'm talking about like for vegetables. Will you be asking us to taste the different secondary ferments? If you want to, you can. I didn't know if you guys would want to taste them straight. That's why I mix them with the honey. Um, but you're welcome to taste them. The sweet's going to taste really good, you know, but the other ones might be like, woo, you know, little... <laughs> A little powerful for you. Ellen? You're storing those in plastic, do they need to be burnt? Yeah, they do, they do gather some air. Okay, so is that why you don't keep them in glass? Oh, I would keep them in glass. Um, I actually keep shio in my fridge in a half gallon mason, but I just like was traveling here, so I popped them in these deli tainers. Yeah. What are the probiotics that are in there? You mentioned amylase and protease. I can send you the profile if you want. I don't know every single thing that's in there. There's a lot of different enzymes. Um, in the case of shio, when you've put it into a secondary fermentation process, you're going to get some like halo-tolerant lactobacillus. You're going to get um, other types of bacteria in there. Um, but I don't, I can't tell you exactly. It's, it's quite... Um, it's quite a collection. But it's going to be more than what I would get from my kimchi and my sauerkraut from fermenting a vegetable. Yeah, I would say you're going to get more enzymes than you would get from, you know, a lacto-fermented vegetable product. Um, you probably, I, I would, I don't know if it's as um, diverse as kefir. Kefir is one of the most diverse ferments that we have. 
Somebody like David Asher can tell you that. I can't tell you that. Um, it would be worth looking up. But I think it's pretty darn diverse. I want to make sure I've gone over with you everything that people do with this. She owes the salty one, right? It's used to brine. You can incubate or cure. So like if you ever sous vide, does anybody here sous vide their food ever? Or make like duck confit or something? So you could like vacuum seal a duck with some of this. Forget about the salt and all the other crap that's in the confit recipe that you're doing. Just put it in with some shio. Keep it at like a 100 degrees in a water bath or something, you know, for, I don't know, I can send you the recipe. Then take it out and cook it in fat and you're, you made duck confit. Like you can do that with this stuff. It's pretty cool. It can take the place of salt curing in some cases. You can substitute salt with it. So if you saute vegetables or you saute meats and you use shio instead of salt, don't use both. It'll be insane. Marinate, provide a dash of umami to a regular savory recipe. I use this as a base for salad dressings. So take a regular salad dressing recipe and throw a little bit of shio in it. It's going to like really take it to the next level. Um, sour amazaki is basically used in the same way that shio's use, except it doesn't have salt in it, right? So it's just going to give you that savory marinade or brine or pickle without the salt component. Um, and get creative. Add herbs to this when you're brining with it. Add herbs to the pickle jar. I just threw it in there quickly for demonstration purposes today, but you can combine it with other ingredients to make things really crazy. I, my friend is growing it on um, cacao to ferment and new flavors of chocolate. Um, he's making mole with fermented chocolate, you know, that's fermented with koji. He's growing koji on the cacao. Like, I mean, just, you know, I mean, once you start really thinking about it, you can go, you can really go anywhere with it. Yeah. The cacao, what is he made with that after he's... Well, he's making a bunch of different stuff. He's making a chocolate vinegar. He's making like chocolate liqueurs. He's making cho straight up chocolate. He's making mole sauces. But all he's doing is instead of just taking normally fermented chocolate to do all those things, he's koji incubating chocolate and then doing all those things. Similar with meat. It's like instead of taking a pork chop, which is already tender and good, and putting it in a pan, it's like, well, why don't I grow a little koji on it, you know, and then, or put a little shio on it and then grill it or whatever. You're going to get it better umami. It's going to bring out the flavor of the pork. You're going to get better browning reactions and on and on and on, you know? You know, it sounds really magical, but we've talked about the scientific reasons for why that is, right? It's the enzymes, you know, that it's releasing. And there's still a lot scientifically that's being studied about aspergillus. Like, one of the things that I like to remember is that, I mean, soy sauce is freaking 2,500 years old, okay? So this process is older than recorded history and older than empirical science. So if you're feeling freaked out about, like, not being advanced enough to do this, don't. It's an old, old process, and you don't have to be a scientist to do it properly. So fermented pepper sauce. Like sriracha? Any, any pepper. You could do it with any pepper. Oh, yeah. Oh, but that takes, like, a, that's a two-week process when you do it. The salt. When you're salting your peppers, yeah. mashing them up. Mm-hmm. Why not throw them in shio for five hours and then you're on your way? Or why not throw them in your koji incubator and grow white fuzz all over them and then, and then proceed, see what happens. But just endless experimentation, you know, endless experimentation. So you talk about pork, what about poultry? Yeah. One of the only ways that, like I used to tell people, never ever cure chicken. That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of in my life. And chicken carries a crazy bacterial load, it has almost zero fat on it. There's like almost no reason why you would use it in charcuterie applications. Koji, you can do it. You, I, would put, I would put a raw chicken inoculated with koji. Just remember, if you're, if you're inoculating something that is not starchy, if it's not a grain, you've got to include a little flour in that. And this is in your handout. So when I'm inoculating you know, proteins, I will toast a little flour. It can be rice flour, it can be all-purpose flour, it can be whatever flour you want. You just need to have some kind of starch for the koji to make friends with basically. And then I'm going to mix the spores in with the flour, and then I put that flour koji mix onto the protein and stick it in the incubator, right? But you can, I mean, there's a recipe, I think Cook's, Cook's Science Magazine did an article on Jeremy, and then they had an article in there for chicken brined in shio, and then koji grown on the chicken, and then fried. Can we hurt ourselves in any way by playing with those various products and as far as like diabetes, high blood pressure, those kinds of things, are there any 
precautions for that you could think of? That's a great question. Um, question being like, what are the limits basically if I'm, if I'm playing around with this and I do have diabetes? Um, I don't know what the limits are for people with diabetes on salt intake, but I'm assuming that you would know you know, what percent salt you're supposed to be consuming. And I would say you would know when you're making these products how much salt you've added. So for example, when I made this shio, I know exactly how many ounces of salt I added to a specific volume of water and rice. So I could then calculate, if I use a teaspoon of that, how much salt I'm actually consuming on my snow peas, for example. Um, and then I would say, if you are under some kind of guidelines on a salt diet, then don't try to produce like a koji bacon that has more than that percent of salt on it, right? So I would say there's nothing inherently about these products that are going to hurt a person who's diabetic or who has hypertension. It's just about moderating the way you consume them, you know what I mean? And being, you know, if you buy a product like this, you may not be able to tell how much salt, I mean, you can tell how many milligrams of sodium it has in it, and that would put you well in your way to um, figuring that out. Um, but outside of Shio, none of the products are inherently salty. So if, if you wanted to um, appreciate the benefits of koji in your diet and you were worried about that, I would say just don't mess with Shio and just mess with the other guys. And the research that you mentioned, um, is that recent? Or, it's I mean kind of across the board. Um, and, and specifically, like, what research you're referring to, I'd be happy to point you in that direction. We have a subscription at the farm to a service called Deep Dive, which is a way for you to read peer-reviewed articles and an unlimited, unlimited access to peer-reviewed articles, which is great for us because we do a lot of research here. Um, it's worth it if you're into this kind of stuff and you like, you know, citizen science and you're screwing around with molds in your basement or whatever, you know. But um, it is, like, $360 a year get access. Um, but I, in my learning about this over the last three years, I've accessed probably thousands of articles about koji and about the way that it's used and about studies of it in rats and lab mice. And I couldn't tell you specifically which study I'm citing when I say, oh, it's been used to treat liver disorders. <laughs> you know, And I would have to go back and look. Um, Okay, so one thing, sweet, so it, somebody mentioned like a sourdough starter. Sour amazaki can be used in breads. So I've made, um, like, if you do make sourdough bread and you have a sourdough starter, try using a sour amazaki in place of the sourdough starter or in addition to sourdough starter, maybe half sourdough starter, half sour amazaki. Um, see what happens. Um, I found that the bread was really nutty. You got a really great, nice, full flavor in the bread. Um, you can use sweet amazake in sweetbreads. You can use it in cakes. Um, we are going to try some ice cream at the end of class that I made with sweet amazake. There's a strawberry balsamic and a green tea vanilla. They're, they contain dairy, so if you're dairy-free, sorry. I didn't make any vegan ice cream. Um, but one thing to be careful about in an ice cream product, you could, you could create the entire sugar component out of amazake, which is amazing. There is no sugar in this. You know what I mean? There's no added refined sugar in this. In a product like a sweet bread or a cake, sugar it acts not only as a sweetener, but as a bulking agent. So you do need to be careful about using it as a sugar substitute in things where you want bulking to happen. Um, so I did put a little sugar in the ice cream just because I was nervous about using all amazaki for this sweet component. But I was able to cut the recipe recommendations in half and then just add, I think it was like a half cup of sweet amakoji. In there. That's interesting because sugar does things to textures in ice cream as well. Does it? Um, have you tried the ice cream? Do you notice any difference in the texture? No, but again, I haven't made it yet with completely no sugar other than Amazaki, so that would be the telling thing, I guess. Aside from shio as like marinade and a drizzle on, on um, sautés or, or meats or, or fish, Sweet Amazaki is a great probiotic boost that's really easy to eat just on its own. So work on this, like in smoothies, shakes, um, oatmeal, uh, eat it as is, whatever, and you're going to be getting that, that punch. Um, let's see. So gem cultures, if you want to buy spores. Um, I don't know if I talked about the different books I brought. 
I don't see wild fermentation. Who's got wild fermentation? Okay, good. So that doesn't have a whole lot of detail about koji in it. If you have it already and you're like, oh, I'll just go read that. It only talks about how to make amazaki and then how to make miso, but it doesn't talk about actually growing koji. If you want to go to Sander Katz for growing koji, go to the art of fermentation. Because there's more information in there about that and there's more information in there about making sake, but there's actually not very much information about making sake in either one of his books. So there's other books and I don't know, these guys can tell you, but there's other guys who've written about sake making that you can go to if you're interested in that. If you're interested in using koji for meat curing, Check out my book. It's the only book right now on the market that talks about koji charcuterie. So it's going to be the place to find how to grow this on meat and then what to do before and after that. One of the things I'll tell you if you have interest in that field is that I'm able to cure meat in a half to a third of the time that I normally would if I use koji. So it's very powerful, very effective. And even though koji has a very distinctive flavor and a very distinctive smell, I don't find that it overpowers what I'm doing and it doesn't, I can't even tell if something's been koji cured. Like I might, if I, if, I've, if I know that it's koji cured, sometimes I notice that the koji has brought out the flavors more than they would normally be there, but it's not like, it's not going to take over the other flavors. Um, and there's been some fear about that because it is very aggressive and it is very distinctive, yeah. So I understand, like, when you're doing kombucha, and if you want to do vinegar, you need to put the vinegar in, like, on a different floor of your house um, so you don't cross-ferment. Is there any concern about the koji cross-fermenting with anything else we have going on? There is definitely concern about it, but I don't, I don't keep my vinegar on a different floor for my kombucha, and I don't keep my penicillium separate from my koji, for example. I've found that I don't really have cross-contamination problems. Maybe it's just that I don't have any yet. But I've been making kombucha and vinegar for over a decade, and I don't have cross-contamination issues going on in my little dark cabinet where I keep those products. Um, and in my charcuterie cabinet, if any koji is like remaining in there, I think it's probably just protective, honestly, of, you know, of the meats that are in there. Even if I don't inoculate them with the koji, it's just keeping other molds from inhabiting the cabinet, which is a good thing. It's pretty new. This is pretty cutting edge in Western cooking. So there's a lot that we don't know. <laughs> Start growing it and you can tell us if you get cross-contamination. <laughs> um, okay, so if you want to check out Jeremy, who's the guy that I mentioned, he has a restaurant or a deli in Cleveland called Larder. And he has an awesome Instagram feed. It's TM Gastronaut, if you're interested in him. And um, last I heard, he's working on a Koji book. So... There should be a lot of information. Oh, also Noma um, out in Copenhagen is releasing or has released a book called The Noma Book of Fermentation, and I am sure there will be koji stuff in there. I haven't got my hands on it yet, but they're doing a lot of work with koji at the Nordic Food Lab and at Noma Restaurant, and so that would be probably be a place to go. If you check out the Nordic Food Lab's blog, there's information about koji there. Growing it, its history, um, I think that there's even a little bit about cross-contamination on there. This book, Preserving in the Japanese Way, is beautiful, even if you don't care about anything I've said tonight, because she talks about like really traditional ways of preserving food in Japanese culture, even just with salt. There's a lot of like fermenting fish in here, which is one of my New Year's resolutions. She does go into like how koji's grown in Japan, which is a really fascinating read. And then she has a lot of great recipes for like salad dressings with shio and making your own like soy sauce kind of light version, not heavy year-long, two-year-long version. Dehydrator uh, goes to 95 is the yeah. lowest temperature. Will that kill? You should try it, Ellen. I have put Koji in my Excalibur that goes to 95, and it didn't kill it, but I just found that it went into its reproductive phase much, phase much faster. And I also had a very hard time keeping the humidity up because it's blowing air through those little shallow trays constantly. So I was like wrapping it in plastic wrap, which helped a little bit. But um, one of the things is that once the koji starts to flower, it itself is generating heat. So even if you've got your incubator at 80, your t internal temperature, I would encourage you to not only have this plug and play thermostat, but to also have one of those little digital weather stations in there that tells you what the temperature and the humidity is, because you'll find that even though this is set at 80 and this is saying, oh, it's 81 in here, that you might actually be seeing more like 90 in the cabinet. 
And so that's why I have mine set at a range from 80 to 82, because I know over the course of a 48 hour solid state fermentation, I'm gonna gain heat as I go, right? So I can set this by the day, the model that I have is like Monday, what do you want the temp to be? Tuesday, on the weekend, what do you want the temp to be? So depending on what day I start, I'll say, okay, it's Wednesday and I'm putting my rice into koji at noon. So on Friday at noon, I'm gonna be pulling it out. So starting Friday morning, I want my temp to be set more like 80, whereas at the beginning of the ferment, I might be at 85. See what I'm saying? So you can control for that. as well? Yeah, because this goes to, it depends on the model of this that you get, but um, this goes from 68 all the way to 88. So I just keep it at like 80, so it's kind of mid-range or maybe a little higher, um, like 82. That's kind of a safe zone, I find. Like 80 to 82 is going to allow, it's not going to get so low that you stop flowering, but it's also going to um, not get so hot that you kill it. And you may find just based on your system how much airflow you have, how big it is, what you're trying to koji, that you do want your temperatures to be a little higher than mine because you will get better coverage if you can, if you can really push the heat, you know, without it getting too hot because it does like, it does like the heat. When you say coverage. I'm talking about the coverage of the mycelia. Like that's okay coverage. That's awesome coverage right there. Like if you get fluffy like snow, you're doing a great job. If I'm trying to reproduce my own spores, I'm getting weaker coverage every time. But I found that even the faintest coverage is still effective. Like I did a copa, which is like neck muscle from pork last week. And I just got like the faintest coverage uh, of koji on it and I was a little disappointed but I went ahead and wrapped it up and put it in the charcuterie cabinet anyway and it's just moving along quite quite nicely it's losing weight it's losing water activity pH is fine like it's curing koji is very powerful in that way it's like you don't have to have the perfect coverage to get the enzymatic benefit with your friend who's doing the chocolate is that like is he just playing around with it or is it available somewhere I don't think it's available it's Jeremy um, <laughs> he's the one doing a lot of different projects with this, um, and I just saw it on his Instagram. So go to his Instagram because if anything, he'll just give you ideas of all the stuff you can do with this, you know, because he's, he's got a really creative mind. So he'll be like, oh, well, why not grow this on a pork, on a pine cone and eat it, you know? Yeah. Do you have any methods um, that you would recommend for doing the 138 degree Fahrenheit? Well, I would say a food dehydrator would probably be, I mean, you're only going to want 138 if you're making amazaki, in which case you don't have to worry about killing, like, the, the flowering stage of koji. Like, you've already got it submerged in the watery rice porridge. Um, so my oven has a dehydrator setting, and I can put it on there. And it will, it will cause my, my sweet amazaki to lose water. So it's th my sweet amazake is thicker than my sour amazake because I'm not putting my sour in a food dehydrator that's sucking water out of it. I'm just putting it back on the koji incubator, setting it at 80 degrees. Um, but that's okay. You know, as long as it doesn't dry out completely, it's fine. Um, so that, so even if your oven doesn't have like a pilot light that will keep a temperature of like a 130, 140, um, a food dehydrator where you can, I mean, some of the, Higher model Excaliburs are just like cabinets. And if you take all the trays out, you can actually put like a jar inside of it or, you know, a ham. And you can, you know, use it as an incubator. Um, but that's, that's a little pricier. It just depends on what, you, what you're trying to do. Um, and then the other thing you could do is just, if you're going to build an incubator for Koji, you could just clear it out of your koji project and then do your amazaki in there and just crank the temp up. My incandescent light would definitely get that box up to 138 degrees if I set the thermometer differently. I mean, that thing will get up to probably 200 degrees with the light on. You could set it higher. Thank you.